worship our God as we gather this morning. We're doing the new church. Let's praise Him. unusual but real gathering of Redeemer Community Church. We're gathering together to worship Jesus who has made us citizens of the heavenly kingdom. And our call to worship comes from Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 7. This is the Apostle John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. 
Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Let's say the Lord is my salvation.
This morning we come to our time when we take a moment to reflect on the week that was passed, a very, very interesting week, and think about some of the things we might come to our Savior in confession. This morning I confess to you that I have been agitated that my schedule and my routine have been massively interrupted. I've found new ways to complain. I've come to see how ungrateful I can be. And I've realized anew how badly I want my comfort over God's will and good pleasure. So would you go with me in confession to our Savior? But church, in confession, we also come to our Savior, like I said, who loves us and we have assurance of pardon. This morning, these great words from Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. Please read aloud at home with me. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Would you pray with me this morning then? Lord, help us to understand the riches of your grace. We recognize that it was the precious, sinless blood of Jesus that secured our redemption, our forgiveness. Help us to realize how much your love has been lavished upon us and respond in gratitude with service to you. Father, we're lifting up some people that need help, some churches that need help. We're thinking of Trinity Baptist Church in Anger, which we've prayed for many times, and we pray again. They probably have a small congregation, and we'll need all of your encouragement these days, these unusual times. We're praying for South Wake Bible Institute, who has had a wonderful semester, and yet we pray again, Lord, for the grace that the students need and the teachers to adjust to new things going on. And just how to do that well. But thank you for that institute and the impact it is certainly having in our community. And we hope in the world too. Father, we're grateful for the good things you've done at Redeemer. People that have gone through surgeries recently and some hardships. But we have much to pray to you about. Not just in gratitude, but with petitions that we make to you for the needs of our, our flock. But right now, Lord, we lift up the world. Our United States our community who is suffering and is wondering and is perplexed. First thing to do, Lord, is to ask you for mercy on those who are sick and dying. We ask for mercy. But we want your name to be glorified. We want people, Father, to come to you in faith, to understand that you are alone, the God of this universe, the creator, the savior, and also the judge. So we pray that great things will be done throughout the entire world but also in our community and our church in this hard time with the coronavirus. And Father, I ask also one thing, that you would give us a permanent home, a place to worship you, and a place to bless Fuquay. We can't see exactly where that's going to come from at this moment, but we're coming to you in faith and praying this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who loves us dearly. Amen. Our members moment is going to be Steve Matthews, who is the chaplain of the Fuquay Verena Fire Department. So he's going to just show us how we can pray for the fire department this morning. Good morning, Redeemer. This is Steve Matthews. I'm sitting outside of Station 3 of the Fuquay Fire Department. It's the smallest of the three stations, but it is no less important. Um, I, the stations, all of the stations are on what I call lock on. That is, they are locked on to keeping you and me safe from a virus that we can't see uh, and the many other intrusions that we can see. Their families, of course, are at much greater risk than most. Every call that a firefighter goes on, they are wondering, is this the call that I come back and I have the virus and then I take it home to my family? 
that's a serious situation for them. It, it is a tension situation for them. And I think it's good that we would be praying for them. <clears throat> I'm asking you to pray for Chief Malden and Chief Jones as they are making some very difficult decisions for every firefighter and their family. Pray for Chief Daniel uh, and Captain Carter as they try to find very important uh, PPE equipment uh, for the firefighters to wear. Pray for the each uh, shift uh, captain as they make critical decisions on every call for their own safety as well as the safety of uh, the people that they're reaching out to. Uh, and then pray for each of the firefighters and their families that the Lord would protect them. And finally, I want to pray for all of us at Redeemer that we would respond to Suzanne Doble's call to um, write letters and cards, send cards to each of the three stations that was on Slack. Uh, I think it was last week. I thank you for that support, Suzanne, and for Redeemer. Thank you all for how you have been constantly willing to reach out. Praying right now is our greatest weapon against uh, this virus that we have among us, and I thank you very much for praying. Thank you, Steve Matthews, for that. We appreciate that so much. I want to welcome everybody who has tuned in, maybe in their living room or family room, but also if you've come in um, and are new to our church and have found um, this link, I appreciate that. Thank you much, so much for coming to us. Um, there is a, a connection card that you could fill out actually on the church website um, that we would love to just know that maybe you found us and we want to know if we can do anything to help you in these days. So let us know about that. But thank you for for being here. We want to remind you in, in this unusual time also to think about your giving, that we are continuing to respond to our Lord who has been so gracious and kind to us. And so we're, we're um, asking you to, to give generously to the work of the ministry going on here and also elsewhere, in fact, the whole world. There are five ways you can give from home. Don't forget those really fast. You can always mail a check to the church office, or you can drop off the check, or you can drop off cash. Secondly, you can go to the Redeemer website, that's redeemernc.org, and click the Give button, and then follow the directions. You can use your phone to give, uh, give through the Redeemer app, which is an app that's easy to download from either iTunes or Google Play. And then you can also have your bank automatically withdraw a regular amount, which is something that we're kind of familiar with these days, so you can do that with your bank if you want to. And fifthly, lastly, you can also give on your phone by texting the keyword, and this is one word, Redeemer NC Give. You text that, Redeemer NC Give, to the number 77977. But that's the way you can uh, part keep participating, even though we're a little bit distanced from one another. Well, let's bless the Lord, and we have more than 10,000 reasons to do so. So sing with us now.
Thank you so much that we're able to bless you and praise you this morning. You are so worthy of our praise. God, as we prepare our hearts this morning, as we are able to sing to you and worship you, that you're so deserving of, God, that, Father, we would be here, not only hearers of the word this morning, Father, but we would also be doers of the word. God, prepare our hearts as we hear the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to a Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, when all this happened, we were in the middle of our study in Philippians, and so we're going to pick up right where we left off a couple weeks ago in Philippians chapter 3. So as many of you know, I've coached basketball for a number of years. There have been some good moments and bad moments, but one of my favorite moments had nothing to do with what happened on the court. It was at halftime of a season-ending playoff game. So the first half had not gone well, not at all. And so when I got to the locker room, I knew I needed to encourage the players. It would have been so easy for them to give up. So I looked out at those sitting in the locker room, the 12 players, my assistant coach, and our manager, an autistic boy named Chandler, and, and I started my stirring speech with a motivational question. I said, is there anyone in this room who doesn't think we can come back and win this game? I could see the determination grow in the eyes of the players, at least until Chandler's hand went straight up in the air and he said, I don't think we can. Like he was right. We didn't come back and win. But we had a great laugh, and we had a great memory from that game. I've realized over the years that a large part of coaching is encouraging players to not give up, to not quit, but to keep going, keep doing what they've been taught to do. The Apostle Paul, he's a good coach. And in our passage this morning, he encourages these Christians living as minorities in a pagan culture to not give up to not quit, but to keep doing what they've been taught to do. Paul has spent most of chapter 3 talking about his own spiritual journey. He began the chapter talking about all the things he had been trusting in to be right with God, his good works, his background, his education, his reputation, his sincerity, all of them worthless when it came to knowing God. His hope, his only hope, 
was the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's one driving pursuit, verse 10, was to know Jesus, to be found in him fully righteous. Now Paul turns from the past to the present in verse 12. He describes his life as a race. That's one of his favorite metaphors. It's a race and he's running hard after the upward call of God, verse 14. He is straining forward. He's pressing on because he doesn't want to end up anywhere but in the presence of Jesus Christ. He wants to know Christ more deeply and experience his power more fully. As he said earlier, everything in his life is about Jesus. For him to live is Christ. Paul's eyes are focused on Jesus. His heart is set on heaven. And every step he takes is a step closer to, be, to being with the Lord. In our passage this morning, we see Paul transition from describing his own pursuit of Jesus to encouraging these Christians in Philippi to pursue Jesus. In these verses, he begins with command, then follows it with a warning before ending with a reminder. All three, the command, the warning, the reminder are intended to encourage Christians to keep running the race, to press on, to strain forward until the day when they cross the finish line. So he begins in verse 17 by contrasting two different ways we can walk. He says, Philippians 3 verse 17, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. So they have two different options of how they can walk. They can walk according to the good examples of Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, or they can walk as enemies of the cross. So the first thing we see in verse 17 is a command. Follow godly examples. Paul tells them to imitate him. Keep their eyes on those who walk like he does. Well, how does Paul walk? Well, he walks like Jesus. He's following Jesus. He, he's chasing after Jesus. He said it this way in a different letter. He said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So in this letter, as we've looked at it the past few months, we've had this up close and personal look at the direction Paul's life is headed. We've seen a flesh and blood example of what it means to live like Christ. To follow Paul's example means we look at difficulties as doorways for gospel advancement. He's writing this from a prison cell. His crime was preaching the gospel. Not sedition, not revolution, the good news of freedom from the chains of sin. And how did he view this unjust imprisonment? Well, he says this in chapter 1 and verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. His difficulties are doorways for the gospel to move into a new place or to a new group of people. Do you follow Paul's example of looking and seeing difficulties as doorways? Now we are smack dab in one of the greatest difficulties of our lives. This is the first and certainly I hope the only pandemic that we will ever experience, at least in our lives. And because of this pandemic, we've lost things important to us. Some of our members have lost jobs, and it's hard to know when people will start hiring again. Others have lost out on once-in-a-lifetime events, tournaments, plays, concerts, classes, honeymoons. None of us has yet lost our life, but all of us have lost some measure of freedom and independence. How will we look at these difficulties? Will we be resentful? Angry, cynical, depressed. We're to follow Paul's example to see every difficulty as a doorway for gospel progress. Have you asked God to show you how to advance the gospel during this pandemic? Like, isn't that a question every Christian should ask? God, how can I advance the gospel in this time, in this season, in this difficulty? So I'm grateful to see many of our members asking that question. Brittany asked that question. And God directed her heart to find out how to help feed children who normally get lunch at school. Suzanne asked that question. 
And God directed her heart to helping first responders who aren't able to quarantine themselves. Scott, even after losing his job, asked that question. And God directed his heart to help his elderly neighbors get their groceries. Many others have asked that question. Have you? If you lost your job or lost out on some special experience, you may be tempted to self-pity. Like, don't give in to self-pity. Don't act as if this suffering is pointless, as if Jesus is not sitting on the throne reigning over the events in this world. Brothers and sisters, each of us need to imitate Paul's example of seeing difficulties as doorways for gospel advancement. Another way to follow Paul's example is to understand the gospel is greater than your life. He said this in Philippians 1 verse 20. He said, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. When is death gain? When death demonstrates the glory and grace of Jesus. When our death leads others to life in Jesus, then we too can say to die is gain. So I read an account this week of an elderly Christian man in Italy who was hospitalized with the coronavirus. He made his rounds in the hospital each day, room by room, and asked people if he could read the Bible and pray with them. His confidence in Christ and his care for others so impacted the doctors that many of them, though professed atheists, started asking him to pray with and for them. At least one of the doctors trusted Christ. Now that Christian man died earlier this week. But for him to die is gain. He died demonstrating the gospel is greater than his life. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to be wise in this time. But we must not give in to fear. The most important thing right now is not your survival. If we believe the gospel, then we believe that this life is not the end, that what awaits us is greater than what we now experience. So our confidence in Christ allows us to risk our safety to serve and bless others. During Martin Luther's life, the bubonic plague spread to his community in Wittenberg, Germany. And so people, they were flocking out of the city in great numbers. Luther and his wife, they were ordered to leave by the town officials, but he refused, believing that it was his duty to stay and minister to those who were suffering and dying. He was asked whether it was okay for a Christian to flee from a deadly plague. And his answer, it was lengthy and wise. And he said it was okay as long as, if there, were, as long as there were enough people to adequately care for those in distress. And he recognized that there were some too weak or sickly to be of help. So of course they should evacuate. But I want you to hear the instruction he gave to ministers, to church leaders. He said this. Those who are engaged in a spiritual ministry such as preachers and pastors must likewise remain steadfast before the peril of death. We have a plain command from Christ. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but the hireling sees the wolf coming and flees. For when people are dying, Luther wrote, They most need a spiritual ministry which strengthens and comforts their conscience by word and sacrament and in faith overcomes death. See, we have a faith that overcomes death. And the decisions we make in times of difficulty reveal whether we, like Paul, understand that the gospel is greater than our life. So not only do we follow Paul's example... But he says we also follow the example of others who are godly. And he doesn't name anyone specifically, but this certainly includes Timothy and Epaphroditus. Because he mentioned them and their example in the previous chapter. And from them we learn to sacrifice like soldiers engaged in spiritual warfare. In fact, that's what he calls Epaphroditus in chapter 2. Verse 25, he says, you're my fellow soldier. And he recounted how both Timothy and Epaphroditus, they had sacrificed in order to serve the church. They sacrificed home and safety, convenience and comfort to minister to those in need. Brothers and sisters, following Jesus is filled with danger. We often forget this because we live in a day and age when danger and disease and death are rarely discussed. Like they're, they're placed behind a curtain and they're kept out of view. 
Right? So someone dies and the funeral home comes in quickly and they remove them and we don't see them for a few days until maybe we see an open casket, but only after them they made up to, to not look quite as bad. But in the past couple of weeks, it seems that God has torn this curtain down and we've been reminded that we are dust, that our lives are merely a vapor. We are soldiers in a grand and global conflict and we need to endure hardness, difficulty, even death as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Like he's given us a mission and this mission requires sacrifice on our part. Are we willing to sacrifice to complete the mission? Paul, Timothy, Paphroditus, they're examples for us. They are patterns that we can follow. So I recently helped my youngest son, Cade, with a school project. He was doing a report on Italy, and so he had to create this presentation board. So on the middle of this board, what he really wanted was a map of Italy. And so what we did is we, we printed out just this small printout of the shape of Italy, and we drew some grids on it. And then we, then we drew some grids on the large presentation board, and then we tried to very carefully match the shapes that were in each grid on the little piece of paper to this big presentation board. And you'll be shocked to hear this, but when we finished, it actually looked like Italy. I said, why didn't you pick a, a country that no one recognizes so they don't have any idea if it's correct? But the problem is everyone knows what Italy looks like. So we had a pattern. We examined the pattern. And then we duplicated the pattern. Hey, brothers and sisters, we need patterns. We need to be around others who are following Jesus. We need to be close enough to see them. We're commanded here, it says, keep your eyes on good examples. This is one reason we so desperately need each other in church. It's one reason we miss meeting together and we've got to work extra hard during this season to stay in touch because we don't imitate Jesus on our own. Verse 17 says, join with me in imitating Jesus. So your faith will grow as you build deep relationships with others in the church. Our, our faith is strengthened by close proximity to real life patterns. I don't know how many times I've heard one of our elders who, who went to check on a member who was going through some sort of difficult season, some trial, some struggle, and they, and they gave a report to the other elders and they said something like this. They're doing exactly how you think they're doing. And what they meant by that is they're imitating Christ. They're responding as good soldiers of Christ. They're, they're seeing their difficulties as doorways for the gospel. They're doing exactly how you think they're doing. I want you to notice one final detail about this command to follow godly examples. He gives this command to brothers or brothers and sisters. See, this command is for Christians. He wouldn't command a non-Christian to imitate Jesus because this type of imitation requires a radical heart change. You can't imitate Christ or followers of Christ unless your heart has been transformed by a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. So if you're not a Christian, but you're trying to imitate Jesus Christ... I'm just going to warn you, all you'll experience is frustration. You need Jesus to change your heart before you can start to follow him. So the first thing we see is the command to follow godly examples. Second, we see a warning. Don't walk away. Look at verse 18. He says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, now we don't know exactly who the enemies of the cross of Christ are. They could be those who claim that Christians needed to follow the Jewish law in order to be right with God. Or, or they could be neighbors, local officials, antagonistic to the gospel. I think they are likely former members. Former members of the church. And I, I think this is the reason Paul says, I, I tell you about them with tears in my eyes because he knows them. He heard them claim to follow Christ and it breaks his heart to now see these, these who claim and testify that they belong to Jesus now walking in opposition to Jesus. Every pastor, every spiritual leader knows the pain of seeing someone turn and walk away from Jesus. Paul understands this pain and so it motivates them, he says, to tell them often not to turn away. 
we've recently talked a lot about the need to persevere in the faith. So this was a regular theme in our recent study of Hebrews. Listen, we can never warn you enough. Don't walk away. Don't turn aside. Though we don't know their specific identity, we were given three reasons that people walk away as enemies. People walk as enemies of the cross. Look at verse 19. It says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. The first reason people walk as enemies of the cross is because of their passions. They make decisions based primarily on how they feel and what they desire at, their, at the moment. So their belly, that's, that's the region that starts below the neck and ends below the belt. That's what drives their decision making. They worship their own passions like food and drink, sex, emotional experiences. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul warned the church about listening to people who, listen to this, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own appetites. Serving their own appetites. Doesn't that sound like a terrible way to live? I want you to think about a time where you made a decision based solely on your appetite. So if you're like me, that means you made a bad decision about what to eat and then you compounded it with eating too much of it. And the result was indigestion and heartburn. If your life is driven by your passions, if you serve your own appetite, you will constantly experience spiritual indigestion and heartburn. You may feel great when you're indulging yourself, but you'll feel miserable after the fact. Serving your own appetite is the opposite of serving Jesus. Jesus tells us to deny ourselves, seek the good of others, and exercise self-control over our passions. You can't be a slave to your passions and a servant of Jesus at the same time. Are you a slave to your passions? Are your decisions motivated primarily by what you desire? By what you want? By what you think sounds appealing? The second reason people walk as enemies of the cross is because of their pride. Verse 19 says they glory in their shame. They pride themselves in what they should be ashamed of. Whenever we sin, we embrace something that caused Jesus to die. Jesus died because of our sin. And so as Christians, what we should be striving by his power is to resist sin, to fight against it. But we certainly shouldn't glory in what Jesus died to forgive but we see evidence of this all around us. In the last year, the hashtag shout your abortion became popular. People would boast on social media about killing their unborn child. People boast about sexual infidelity and endorse all matter, manner of evil and wickedness in the name of progress. During the coronavirus, some pornography providers have given subscriptions, free subscriptions to their services As an act, they say, of kindness. Whenever a person knowingly, willfully, and shamelessly celebrates what God calls sin, they are setting themselves in opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The third third reason people walk as enemies of the cross is because of their priorities. Paul ends his list in verse 19 with the phrase, minds set on earthly things. So enemies of the cross are captivated by created and temporary things. They are so focused on what they see, touch, taste, and handle that they lose all capacity to understand and appreciate what is transcendent. So I can think of no more appropriate anthem for earthly mindedness than the one written by John Lennon. Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Living for today. No thought about what lies beyond what we can see. Minds set wholly on earthly things. Brothers and sisters, this is the opposite of how God tells us to think. Colossians 3 verse 1, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Are you captivated by earthly things? 
Or do your goals and your dreams transcend what you can see? So if, if your mind is set on earthly things, then you're putting your hope in what's broken. Everything you see, everything around us is broken. And that's why it can't ultimately bring us satisfaction. Broken things can't make a person whole. This is why we value people over possessions. We value saving lives over saving the economy. Enemies of the cross have chosen to walk a direction ruled by earthly passions and pursuit, and that direction always and only leads to destruction. Verse 19, their end is destruction. Four simple words, but packed with powerful meaning. If you walk away from Jesus, if you walk opposed to the cross, you have no hope. It always and only lead to one destination, destruction. Friends, this is a warning to anyone who thinks there are multiple ways to get to God. There is only one way, and that is Jesus Christ. All other ways lead to destruction. Our family recently spent a few days at the beach. So a friend who's, who's down there quite regularly, he, he, he was driving me around the area and he, he showed me a street that's referred to as Millionaire's Row. I mean, the houses, were, were, they were unbelievable. They're hard to even describe. And so as we were driving through and talking about these houses and looking at them, it, it led us into a discussion about what lasts, what matters. And I remember saying to my friend, do you realize that for a person who doesn't know Jesus, this world is as close to heaven as they will ever get. And for those of us who know Jesus, this world is as close to hell as we will ever get. See, the end of everyone who refuses to come to God through Jesus Christ and his cross is destruction. And so, brothers and sisters, this is why we share the gospel, because we know how it ends. We have seen the final scene of the movie. And so we beg and we plead for people to repent of their sins, to stop worshiping at the altar of their own passions, to stop glorying in what is shameful, to stop pursuing what will one day burn up. So Paul has instructed us to follow godly examples, and he's warned us about walking away, and he ends with a reminder Remember your citizenship. Verse 20. He says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. A powerful picture is being painted by this image of citizenship. Now we know that those in Philippi, they, they took their Roman citizenship seriously. In fact, that's the reason they give for Paul to be in prison back in Acts 16. They're like, whoa, we Romans, we don't act like this. See, their, their citizenship determined their conduct. Our citizenship not only speaks to our future destination, but to our current occupation. So we are citizens of heaven. And we long for the day when we finally make it to the capital city. We are rightful citizens of heaven, and we will not be denied entrance. But while we live apart from our future home, we embrace the culture and priorities of heaven in our current community. See, this is what the Philippians were doing. They were trying to live as Roman citizens, even though they lived a long way from Rome. We don't live in heaven now. But our citizenship citizenship in heaven should influence how we live on earth. Our goal should be to bring the culture and values of heaven into our cities on earth. We should work to expand heaven's influence in our town. Fuca Verena should should regularly get a smell, a sight, a sound of heaven because citizens of heaven live within the town limits. So do people in our community Long for heaven because of time spent with you. Do they get a a faint scent of a faraway land because they see the works you do in Jesus' name? If you were living in a Roman colony, thousands of miles from the capital, the one thing you long for, really above anything else, 
was for a visit from the emperor himself. If the emperor came, you were sure everything would be better. The arrival of the emperor would mean safety and security, blessing and bounty, glory and grandeur for everyone. The emperor was a savior who could fix everything, make everything better. Or so you hoped. This is exactly what people hope for today. Right? Every four years. People put their hope in a savior whose reign will bring prosperity on the country. He will vanquish enemies. He will secure freedom. He will make sure we remain prosperous. Like even right now, people are hoping for a savior. Someone who will stand up in front of the TV cameras and announce a cure for the coronavirus. Brothers and sisters, we wait for a savior too. But not some frail, weak, human king or president. A king ravaged by time and trouble. We await a savior with the power to truly transform everything we see, everything we know. Our savior conquered death and he brings us into his victory. We must refuse to look at any human being as our savior. We must not think that our future is secured by someone at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We must not put our hope in a new law or a new politician. And, and we certainly need to make sure that we're not focused on spreading the values and goals of a particular political party. Our, our values and goals, they flow from heaven. They come from a lamb, not a donkey or an elephant. We belong to heaven. You know, we, we belong to heaven our King, our Savior, is coming. And when He comes, He will renew. He will reshape. He will remake everything. All the brokenness will be restored when our Savior appears. This confident hope, this certain expectation is what keeps us from quitting. Even when it seems like the world is upside down. Just keep walking. Like, just keep going, just keep moving forward, keep following godly examples. And with every step, remember the king is coming soon. Like, nothing can stop him. Nothing can stand in his way. That's how this passage ends. All things, which include governments and viruses, are subject to him. I don't know how long we'll be in this situation. How long we'll go without seeing each other face to face. But this encouragement from Philippians seems especially precious to me in these days. As I was studying these verses, a chorus came to mind. It was written by the pastor of a small church that we would visit on vacation sometimes when I was young. Here's how the chorus went. It said, don't quit. There's a job to be done. Don't quit. There's a race to be run. Don't quit. There's a crown to be won. Don't quit. Weary Christian, don't quit. So if you right now feel weary and worn out, maybe you're ragged and run down, I just I want you to hear this and be encouraged. That whatever you do, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop running. Heaven is our home. Jesus is our king. And our future has never been brighter. Don't quit, weary Christian. Don't quit. Father, help us. Help us to keep walking after the examples you've given us. Walking after those who reveal and show us that difficulties are doorways for the gospel to move forward. They, they reveal in their lives that the gospel is greater than our lives. That we are soldiers who sacrifice to accomplish the mission. Help us not to walk as enemies of the cross, living for our passions and our pursuits and living in pride, glorying in what you call shameful. But instead, Lord, help us to remember that we don't belong to this earth. We belong to heaven 
that we await a king who comes with the power to remake, restore, renew all things. And may that memory of the king, may the, may the longing for his return, may it motivate us to just keep walking, to not quit in spite of the weariness, in spite of the difficulty, the frustration. Help us not quit, but keep walking after Christ. I pray this for my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh,
May we sing that song in our hearts this week, that it is well with our soul. Just a few important reminders before you go this morning. First, our community groups are continuing to meet virtually. So let me encourage you to commit to gathering through whatever technology platform you choose. Let's not underestimate the power of gathering, praying, and encouraging one another as we meet, particularly in these times. Second, as you would imagine, the impact of the coronavirus has gone beyond health and has affected finances of many as people have lost jobs and have limited hours. This includes those in our community who are reaching out to churches and asking for assistance, but also those within our church. And this is what our Benevolence Fund is for. So please give and give generously towards this as we seek to bless those people who we love around us. You can give to the Redeemer Community Church app or on our website. Third, we're continuing our devotional study starting tomorrow. So we finished First Peter over the past two weeks, and now we're going to begin looking at the book of Isaiah. So stay tuned for updates via Slack, email, and you can also check those uh, devotionals out on our YouTube channel. And then finally, I'd encourage you all to join our live lobby and prayer room on Facebook at 1115 this morning. To do this, you can go to the Redeemer Community Church Facebook page and look for the live video at the top of that page in a few moments. But before we go, let's consider our words of commission this morning and remember what we're not only affirming, but we're asking God to do. That is to draw every tribe and tongue and nation to himself. We're asking him to remove that which would hinder such a work and use us as the church to accomplish this work in the world. So please join me in reading Psalm chapter 67, verses one through four. And I'll read. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face to shine upon us so that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Go in peace, Redeemer.